This is AutoLine Daily, the show dedicated to enthusiasts of the global automotive industry. Tesla's slowdown in sales in China could be turning serious. Tesla is cutting back production at its Shanghai assembly plant by eliminating weekend shifts. Bloomberg reports that in the first two months of the year, only half of Tesla's production in China was sold in China. The rest was exported. The fact that Tesla is not trying to export more cars to make up for the slowdown means it didn't think there was that much export demand. Sales of new energy vehicles in China, which includes BEVs and PHEVs, are expected to grow 25% this year. But so far, Tesla sales in the country are down 6%. Meanwhile, new car sales in the U.S. for March are expected to come in at 1.5 million units, up more than 12% from last year. Fleet sales will account for 19.7% of the mix, while EVs will hit 9.1% market share, says J.D. Power. It forecasts that the SAR will hit 16.4 million units and says consumers will spend $139 billion on new vehicles, an all-time record for the first quarter. Several things are powering sales right now. Inventory is growing, prices are coming down, and automakers are offering more incentives. Another thing to keep in mind is that people who have filed their taxes early are starting to get their refunds, and that always helps car sales. Earlier this week, it was reported that Ford is delaying plans to launch a three-row electric SUV, and now Canadian workers at the plant where it's scheduled to be built want answers. Ford's plant in Oakville, Ontario is scheduled to be retooled at the end of April to build the electric SUV. But the plant's chair at the facility says Unifor, the union that represents Canadian workers, haven't received quote-unquote official word from Ford about the upgrade since November of last year. So it's now pressing the company for answers about the delay and says it is extremely disconcerting they haven't had clarification from the company. The model was scheduled to go on sale in 2025, but now reports say it's been delayed until the end of 2026. Ford is remaining tight-lipped for now. A spokesperson told Automotive News that it doesn't comment on speculation. Aston Martin has a new CEO. The automaker announced that it hired Bentley chairman and CEO Adrian Hallmark as its new chief executive. Hallmark is replacing Amadeo Felisa, who will remain CEO at Aston until Hallmark takes over no later than October 1st. Hallmark has been the head of Bentley since 2018, and he's also held positions at Volkswagen and Porsche. But he shouldn't get too comfortable in his new position. Hallmark is the fourth CEO that Aston Chairman Lawrence Stroll has hired since he took over in 2020. When the elements are working against you, being confident in your grip on the road is what really matters. Bridgestone Alenza tires, improved acceleration in wet conditions. Cupra, the performance brand of Spanish automaker Seat, which itself is part of the Volkswagen Group, announced it's going to enter the U.S. market. By the end of the decade, it will launch two electric vehicles. One of those will be the BEV version of the Formenter, which is a small crossover that it currently sells, but right now it's only available with gas and hybrid powertrains. The other model is a bigger crossover that will be built in North America, including Mexico. Cooper says it will incorporate a new distribution model for sales, which sounds like they will initially kick off in states that have adopted the same or similar emission targets as California. Chinese automaker Zeker, which is part of Geely, is coming out with a new vehicle called the Mix that I think looks like a modern-day interpretation of the old Dustbuster minivans. It's an interesting shape with very short front and rear body overhangs. Reports say it will have up to a 310 kilowatt or 415 horsepower electric motor and CATL batteries, but no size for the pack was given. It looks like the mix will incorporate a number of sensors, including LiDAR based on its positioning, for advanced driver assistance features. And that would make a lot of sense because Waymo is likely going to get a version of this model for its robo-taxi fleet 
through a partnership that it developed with Zeker. And it's said that Waymo could launch that vehicle in the U.S. before the end of the year. Nikola is celebrating the opening of its first hydrogen refueling station for Class 8 trucks. Located in Southern California in the city of Ontario, the station is being run by Nikola's Hyla brand, which is responsible for producing, distributing, and dispensing hydrogen for its fuel cell trucks. The station is capable of fueling up to 40 trucks a day, and Nikola plans to have 14 stations operational by the end of the year. If you buy a Ranger Raptor, Ford wants you to go to school to learn how to drive it, but I mean really drive it, like flat out across the desert floor, clawing up steep rocky slopes and flying over big humps on the road. Ford built what it calls the Ranger Raptor Assault School, a 220 acre facility outside of Salt Lake City, Utah. The idea is to teach owners how to use the different driving modes and all wheel drive settings to achieve maximum performance. And it has a range of off-road courses to hone your skills. There's even different courses for the Ranger Raptor versus the F-150 Raptor. Ford equips students with helmets and Hans devices and then takes them out with expert instructors to build up their skills step by step. Starting out in normal mode with full stability and traction control, then moving to sport mode, which backs out some of that stability and traction, and then going to Baja mode, which takes everything off. And here's the best thing about it. It's free. Well, okay, nothing in life is free these days, but the cost of the one-day school is included when you buy a Raptor, and all you have to do is get yourself there. Tesla pretty famously started a bug bounty program where it pays hackers to find vulnerabilities in its vehicles. And because of one issue that was just found by a team of hackers, it paid out 200 grand and gave away a free Tesla Model 3. That seems like a pretty big sum to me, but they were able to get into a Tesla ECU or electronic control unit and its CAN bus system, which probably means they could have taken over any part of the car. What's more, that same hacker group got 100 grand back in January for finding a completely different vulnerability in a Tesla. Tesla kicked off a 48-volt frenzy when it announced the Cybertruck uses a 48-volt electrical system. But not everything on the Cybertruck is 48 volts. Some of it's still 12 volts. It steps down the voltage where needed with a transformer. This also means that legacy automakers, whose suppliers can't convert their components to 48 volts quickly, can still implement 48 volts as their suppliers make the transition. But transformers can be bulky and heavy, so a company called Vicor uses what it calls sign application conversion that can do it with small silicon chips. And it says legacy automakers and suppliers are very interested in its technology. This makes it much easier for them because they don't have to build their plan upon having all of the loads in the door 48 volts or all of the loads in the front end module 48 volts. They can have the local 12 volt. And as I said, you can add these to, to step up power. You can also subtract these as your power needs go down. So as you take some of those 12 volt loads and you convert them to 48 volts and you need less power, you can simply use one less module. If you want to hear more, we've got that interview on the AutoLine website or on our YouTube channel, and we'll also provide the link. But that brings us to the end of today's show and this week. Thanks for making AutoLine a part of your day, and I hope that you have a great weekend. AutoLine Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone, solutions for your journey, and by Intrepid Control Systems. Over-the-air engineering. Boost your game. Intrepid's NeoVi Pi, allowing automotive engineers to interface, capture, and monitor vehicle data using Raspberry Pi. As a matter of fact, it's the automotive industry's first robust platform for Raspberry Pi, featuring Intrepid CanFD technology and Raspberry Pi compute module. The NeoVi Pi is designed for automotive environments allowing use with relative power ranges and applications. In addition, the NeoVi Pi enables you to use the Raspberry Pi for compute while avoiding additional development to adapt to network environments. That makes the NeoVi Pi powerful enough to solve your vehicle network problems, 
yet small enough to fit in your backpack. One of many intrepid tools used for developing zonal architecture and software defined vehicles. Wards is the industry leader for news, data, and analysis. That's why companies across the globe subscribe to our premium service, maybe even your own. Log in for subscriber access now. Check your company's intranet for details and rely on wardsauto.com to keep you informed.